I think anyone who owned a PlayStation 3 or who was just into gaming back in the day can probably remember that infamous Killzone 2 trailer, with Guerrilla Games claiming it was showing actual gameplay and using an in-game engine, but as we all later found out, the whole thing was just entirely pre-rendered. It's gone down in history as one of the biggest gaming crocs of all time and is a great example of the bullshot trend of the mid-2000s, but it also created an interesting premise, making us wonder just how long it might be until games could get to that point where they'd actually look that good. I don't think they got there with Killzone 2 or Killzone 3. I mean, don't get me wrong, they sure looked good, all things considered. But I do think they hit the back of the net visually when Killzone 4 was eventually released. Killzone Shadow 4 was released as a launch title for the PlayStation 4 way back in 2013. And at the time, it appeared to be a pretty good justification for buying out this new console. I can scarcely believe it's a 10 year old game in terms of how good it looks, but also how it plays. Because in that regard, it really feels like it should be a 15 or 20 year old game instead. You see, for all of its bells and whistles and shiny dangling objects, Killzone Shadowfall is just a complete dud of a shooter. And honestly, just a crappy game in general. And that's a wound that goes even deeper when you realise it was the only FPS exclusive release for the platform. I mean, not counting all those VR titles. Take this opportunity. To reflect on your behavior. And if you want to get even more depressed, well, how's about this fact? It's the last FPS exclusive for any Sony console, period. In fairness, the PlayStation 3 didn't do huge numbers either. I mean, you had the Resistance games, you had Haze, and we all know how that turned out. It's gonna be a fun day. As well as obviously Killzone 2 and 3, but still, that's like half a dozen games all up. I mean, a hell of a lot better than just one. Yeah, it doesn't make for much bragging rights when your only contender is clinging onto the corpse of a once great franchise. I'm talking about the campaign, of course, not the multiplayer mode. I'm not even remotely interested in trying to get into what's a 10 year old community at this point. I mean, I may as well just go outside and stand in the middle of the road dodging traffic, because I think that would be more forgiving than trying to get into that aspect of the game at this point. But I mean, according to what info I can find on the internet, that side of things is pretty much dead anyway. Sadly too, I couldn't even find much fun in the bot zone mode either because the bot AI is just ridiculously lethal, even on the so-called medium difficulty. And at times, it just seems to flat out cheat. Right, so before we get too far into it, I do need to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. And I actually realized today that I've been using these guys now for over two years. I mean, yikes. That's two years I've been able to use my internet without worrying about people stealing my information. But what's a VPN? Well, I'm so glad you asked. A VPN is a virtual private network and it rewrites all of your data through a secure encrypted server, meaning people can't get access to it. It's good for torrenting, which is what I use it for the most, but also keeping your activity hidden from your ISP. You can also use it to change your region, so with streaming sites like Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows that you wouldn't normally get. Like Netflix Japan, for instance, has a much bigger range of anime titles, obviously, which I know is something that a lot of my viewers are into. Yeah, don't deny it. <laughs> All up, you can choose from over 90 different countries and get rock solid connection speeds every time. Like I said, I've been using these guys for over two years now, and it's really just as easy as click and connect, and then you're good to go. But if you still don't believe me, in which case I wonder why you're even watching, well, then there's still plenty of positive reviews from actual users, along with bigger websites like TechRadar and CNET. So if you want to join the club and get three extra months for free, well, head over to expressvpn.com forward slash gman and get started. Coming back to the campaign though, I don't know what it really is about Shadowfall that makes it so forgettable, but I think a big part of it is that it's probably a sequel that never needed to be made in the first place. Now, Guerrilla Games I think are really good at making better looking versions of games that people are already playing, if that makes sense. That's something I think you can see in the recent Horizon games, but also more importantly back to that first Killzone game on the PlayStation 2. If you play Killzone 1 and then go play whatever Medal of Honor or other console shooter was out around the same time, well, you're gonna see that they control very similarly. Much in the same vein, it has an aiming mechanic where you have to stand still to be more precise, along with manual health, as opposed to regenerating health, needing med kits to stay alive. And it also has objective-based level design, lacking even the basic convenience of a mid-level checkpoint. Overall, it's not inherently bad, but it's really just the same as what everyone else was pretty much doing at that same point. The only differing factor was the art style and the visuals, which were admittedly pretty unique and looked a hell of a lot different to other games, even if it did often run at a frame rate that felt like single digits. It was not, however, any kind of new cornerstone for console shooters. 
makes the whole thing even more hilarious when you think about how people used to say that this was going to be Sony's Halo killer. And looking at gameplay of Killzone side by side with Halo 2 on the Xbox is just laughable. And I'm not even a huge Halo guy, but even I can admit that Halo 2 just runs rings around it, pun intended. Overall, it didn't get much of a glowing reception. I mean, it scored all right, but hardly the generation-defining shooter I think people were hoping for. As far as PlayStation 2 shooters go, well, look, it's far from the worst, but it's nowhere near the top of that heap either. Now, if you look at Killzone 2, though, and compare it to other shooters at the time of its release, it's easier to see the same kind of design hallmarks from, again, other games at the same time, too. This time, the Call of Duty series. However, this thing released to almost universal acclaim, and you've got to wonder, why is that? Well, I think the reason that Killzone didn't make as much of a splash as the second game did was that the jump from 5th to 6th generation consoles was an actual pretty big deal. And it was really the generation of gaming when ordinary people could look at a video game and start to get excited by it. There was a much more higher level of detail in video game graphics now that meant you didn't have to use your imagination so much anymore to fill in the blanks. Games now looked cinematic. They could pull off semi-realistic visuals, have believable characters with fully motion-captured cutscenes, plus the scope of what could be created seemed almost limitless. Okay, here we go. No, hold on, hold on. Killzone 2 was a game that was on the forefront of really being able to take advantage of that and hammer the whole thing home with its new improved graphics engine. But more than that, the characters and the environments could be fully realized. And to this day, I think it's a testament as just to how to make a really truly believable and lived-in game world. Not only was it a visual spectacle, but the world of Helgen was as hostile as its population was. Volatile, violent and destructive like my stomach after a night at the curry house. The entire planet was in the midst of a horrible storm that felt like the place was being ripped apart from the inside out. Again, like my stomach, after the night, the curry house. <coughs> it's not hard to see why this game had a huge effect at the time when it came out, and the reason is that there really was nothing like it at the time. Especially for the PlayStation 3, and especially as far as first person shooters went. I mean, Resistance 2 had come out like a year or so prior, and we'd had Haze before that, lol, but Killzone 2 just shits all over both of those. But now, here's the thing about Killzone 2, right? When people look back on it, I don't think they're going to be looking back and remembering how amazing the gunplay was. I don't think anyone's going to be looking back and saying to themselves, oh man, that one level in that street where I shot those 10 guys, you know, that was so awesome. Nah, son, they're going to be talking about how unique it all felt and played. They're going to be talking about those epic cinematics and those watershed moments. Or they're going to be talking about the absolutely awesome soundtrack. I mean, seriously, listen to the main menu theme from this thing and tell me you don't get a boner from it. The physical presence of the Hellgast could now be appreciated much more now due to the high fidelity offered by the PlayStation 3 and there was a definite visceral feel to the combat. Shooting these guys at point blank range, you'd see them recoil back in pain as you gunned them down and it still impresses stuff to this day. But again, gameplay wise though, it wasn't anything entirely new or groundbreaking and the combat just consisted of shooting constant waves of incoming enemies as you push down what's essentially a giant corridor until the whole level comes to an end. I mean, occasionally you'll pick up an RPG, you'll hop into a tank, but the whole thing plays out very safe and, and seemed to do what everyone else was doing at the same time. And like I said before, that's something that all of Guerrilla Games' games all have in common. I don't know man, it's kind of like their modus operandi. They're really good at making these stunning looking worlds and they clearly have some super talented people working in their art departments. But then when it comes to the gameplay loops, well, it's like they never know how to add in anything new. That first Horizon game, for instance, I think looks ridiculously good. I mean, even that first game on the PlayStation 4 still looks like a good pass for a 2022 game easily. But then you start to play it and it's like, you know, is this it? And now finally getting onto Shadowfall, I think for me, that's the same reason why the whole thing fell so short. And, you know, I guess a bunch of other people too. Because once you get past how good the whole thing looks, and yes, it does look good, it starts to dawn on you that you're really just playing a visually updated version of the same game you've played three times already. You just can't get by on good looks anymore when everything else is, for lack of a better word, shit. And I think gamers back at the time were starting to realize that. This game surfer from all the problems a bad game is at its most. Poor level design, poor AI, the history sucks, just a freaking corridor, like all linear games. 
Graphics are amazing, but are graphics enough to be a good game? No, where are all the fun of games nowadays? Gunplay irritating sometimes, and all in all is a frustrating game. Fuck you Gorilla and Sony. Now I can't see any other reason for Shadowfall being made other than just to be an easy win for Sony, and a way to piggyback off the brand recognition and coincide with it being a launch title. And I think it would have definitely stood out amongst the others, considering the other games available at the time were pretty piss weak. Yeah, anyone else remember Knack? Yeah, that was a good one. After this thing came out, I remember there being all these articles about it selling a bazillion copies, which I think isn't all that much of a brag considering the context. I mean, it was the only exclusive FPS for the platform at the time, and it still is. It's like opening up a McDonald's in a small town, then bragging about how it outsells the local pie shop. I mean, if you give someone a glass of water in the desert, they're not going to turn it down to die of thirst, know what I'm saying? Review scores, however, told a more interesting tale, and it ended up being one of the lowest scoring games in the entire series, almost as low as the first game. Sometimes there's a disconnect between the critic and the user scores, with one being higher or lower than the other, but this time around it seemed to be a universally lukewarm response from both sides. So, what exactly happened here? Well, I can say one thing, they sure didn't mess up the way the whole thing looks. Let me show you something. I reckon you could show this game to someone who doesn't know any better, so, you know, any current day Sony fanboy would be perfect. Got it. <laughs> Tell them this was a 2022 release and they'd probably believe you. I mean, it looks that good. There's an early cinematic where it flies over one of the main cities and it looks like it could pass itself off as being pre-rendered. And unlike Killzone 2 or 3, it doesn't use all these visual effects to appear more cinematic. It just gets by on how technically solid the whole thing looks. This is all we have. It does, however, come at the expense of the tone overall and it's just got this far more clean, shiny and tidy look to it. And when you take away the main thing that made the other games so memorable, being that harsh, uninviting backdrop of Helgen as a planet, then replace it with this bright new backdrop, well, then it does kind of end up looking like a bit of a tech demo. As for the premise and the story, the question I ask, again, is this a story that really needed to be told? Try it. It won't be as easy as the last time. Kind of like the Matrix Resurrections of video game sequels, or I guess maybe Matrix Resurrections is the Killzone Shadowfall of sequels. Either way, it's bad and it sure didn't need to be made. Now, despite the issues I had with Killzone 3, I always kind of felt like the ending for that fitted. By the end of the third game, the line between who were the good guys and who were the bad guys had truly been blurred. Through their actions, the ISA had pretty much wiped out most of the planet, defeating the Hellgan, but also killing countless innocent civilians in the process. Oh my god. So it was kind of fitting that the characters who started out as typical dude bros going in to save the galaxy from the evil space Nazis in some ways ended up doing more harm than good. Your king went down like a pussy. Whoa, -ho -ho, soldier. The end twist of Starla escaping and surviving wasn't the be-all and end-all, it just kind of felt like a fun way to leave things open-ended. But like a lightning bolt zapping through the neck of a corpse amalgamated together with the body parts of criminals and degenerates, Shadowfall takes the pieces of a dead story and tries to bring it back to life again. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. It takes place 30 years after all of that stuff, with the surviving Hellgast now living on Vector, with a giant wall separating the two factions, because yeah, that's not going to cause dissent. As a result, and to the surprise of absolutely no one, both sides are constantly trying to fuck around, and a terrorist organization called Black Hand, real creative name by the way, is formed and goes to war against the VSA, which is kind of like an intelligence group working for the ISA. Makes sense? During the prologue, you're playing as a kid named Kellen, because apparently every Sony game ever made has to have a sequence where you're playing as a little kid. Anyway, after trying to sneak out of the city, after it's under attack by Helgen forces, your dad is killed and you're saved in the nick of time by a shadow marshal named Sinclair. Well, looks like you're gonna have to stick with me, kid. Who then, during the most abrupt montage ever, jumping years ahead with each jump cut, trains Kellen to become a shadow marshal himself. All our people want is to be kept safe. That means taking the fight to the Hellgast. Twelve seconds later. The Shadow Marshal program is honored to have you, Lucas. The fuck is that? Yeah, and get used to interacting with this dollar store Nick Fury because this is about the only person you ever seem to talk to. 
Gone is the camaraderie between Sevchenko and his buddies, about the only person you ever really engage with is Sinclair, and then eventually a Helgen agent named Echo, who I imagine is going to be spending an absolute fortune on chapsticks, because those lips I think are big enough to block out the goddamn sun. You disgust me. Also, the same actress who is voicing Echo plays a character in a similarly generic futuristic shooter with Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. You talk about being typecast. Please, I never call me that! She definitely does a better job at it than the dude voicing Kellen though, and for someone who's supposed to be this badass special forces elite soldier, he sure sounds like a bit of a wimp. You're gonna let his death mean nothing? They are innocent people! No! But it does make for a pretty cool dynamic, I guess, as both Kellen and Echo have to figure out what the hell Gast are up to with this new bioweapon and what it's gonna be used for. It's kind of sad though that it still portrays the Hellgast as being these cookie cutter villains. You know, these almost comically over the top bad guys. And the fact they're all still wearing those masks that covers 90% of their faces removes any humanity from them completely. About the one thing I can praise though is that it doesn't have the atypical 15 minute long patented Sony exclusive cinematics. You know, where every single character is very clearly mo capped and overacting video game dialogue as if they're reciting Othello. No! Now as for the shooting and the combat, Shadowfall did get praise at the time for offering up a more open-ended approach to the levels, but I think what people are mostly referring to is whether or not you're going to be using stealth or combat. And you've really got to hand it to these guys for not even including any basic stealth mechanics here. Outside of just crouching to make yourself harder to spot. You can perform scripted takedown animations too, but there's not even any way to move or hide the bodies. I mean, you don't even get a weapon with a lousy silencer. Not at least until right up near the end of the game, but I'll get to that bit soon enough, don't worry. There's no detection markers or bars that fill up to let you know when you're being seen. There's none of that. You just kind of crouch walk around, staying out of everyone's line of sight and then hoping for the best. And when they see you, well, you might as well put a neon sign around your neck and start screaming out the lyrics to Motley Crue's Kick Start My Heart. Occasionally, there'll be a terminal you need to hack to stop reinforcements, but it's got about as much depth as a foot bath. Of course, it's also got that good old scan the area feature. We can highlight enemies and objects through solid walls, you know, in lieu of expecting the play to listen to audio cues and to use the environment as to figure out where enemies actually are. Yeah, now nah, let's not do that. Let's just make them fucking glow through walls. There's not even any kind of real punishment for being detected though, so as a result, you're probably going to spend most of the time just shooting stuff, which is fine. I mean, no one plays a kill zone game expecting to pussyfoot around. And it's a brand new PlayStation 4 FPS game, so you're expecting them to just pack this thing with heaps of new mechanics, right? Except, no, they, they didn't do that. Shadowfall again uses the weapon limit approach from the previous games, but it somehow makes it even worse, to the point that it's more or less like a one weapon limit. Because you're always forced to hold onto this VSA assault rifle as a primary weapon, and it almost never leaves your hands the entire campaign. This thing's got two highly unique modes, and are you sitting down right now? Because this thing might blow your socks off. You ready? Okay, the first one is a standard aim down the sights fire mode. The second one, wait for it, is a sniper mode. Yeah, where well you can zoom in much more and charge up the rifle for more damaging shots. How do they come up with this stuff? The thing is though, unlike the revolver in Killzone 2 and 3, this thing doesn't have infinite ammo, so it's not really possible to use as a fallback weapon, which, you know, was kind of the point of the revolver in the first place to begin with. The weird thing is how Killzone 3 actually introduced a 3 weapon limit, because if you remember, you could carry a primary weapon and then a heavy weapon like an LMG or a sniper rifle, plus then have that third secondary one to fall back on. So, I mean, if anything, that means that Shadowfall has actually regressed from Killzone 3, and that's just silly. I get, too, that this thing is set 30 years in the future, but I also kind of dislike how none of the weapons feel like they have any personality anymore. I mean, in the other games, when you picked up a Helgen rifle, it looked like a Helgen rifle. Those weapons were designed and built for functionality. They didn't have all the bells and whistles or the aesthetics of vectored weaponry, and you could tell they were supposed to look like something being mass-produced by the thousands to arm these fanatical soldiers. It played into the whole futuristic World War II vibe they were going for, and it also tapped into the idea of the Hellgas being this industrialist working class civilization. I mean, these guys have had to fight for everything, even down to just having breathable air. Everything now, though, just looks so shiny and pristine, and there's so little difference artistically between each of these factions' weaponry. 
Regards to the weapon though, you know the drill. Assholes and elbows. You aim down the sights, you shoot people, and then you hide behind something when that blatantly obvious cue tells you that you're gonna die. Because of that dog shit HDR effect that so many PlayStation 4 games often seem to have, enemies can be near impossible to distinguish from the background sometimes too, and yeah, that's fun. And how's about the shotgun in this thing, which has this really weird effect of making people jump backwards when they're hit by it. Often when the physics don't really make sense for it to happen that way. Reminds me of that one scene from Django Unchained. Bye, Miss Laura. I will say one thing, and that is, I like the minigun you get your hands on here. And if there's one thing I have to praise these guys for, it's the way they always seem to nail the way that these heavier weapons feel. There's a petrocyte cannon you get later on in the game too, which just outright vaporizes enemies and sends them to the goddamn Shadow Realm, or the Shadow Fall Realm, I guess. And this thing is also really fun to use, much more fun than whatever boring, generic hit scanning weapon you're gonna be using for that other 90% of the game. So for the few short times I got to lug these things around, it made me not want to kill myself. The sad part is that I often can't even kill myself if I want to, because you've got this little flying drone thing called an owl that revives you half the time. I guess one way in which Shadowfall does try to differentiate itself and do something new is with this dinner plate sized drone that can fly out and perform a few basic tasks. Firstly, it can simply be sent out in an offensive capacity, hovering around and shooting at enemies, something it's so effective at that it's almost kind of boring in a way, because it often kills enemies more quickly than you do. Plus, it also carries the player even further with the ability to revive you if you're carrying spare adrenaline packs. In fact, it kind of makes you wonder why they don't just mass produce these things and send them into battle with express orders to kill every Helgen on sight. It's kind of like those little sentry robots from Doom 3, and again, you have to wonder how the good guys are losing the fight here, when these little dynamos exist. Later in the game, you'll see guys with energy shields, and the owl can also zap them, shorting those shields out and making them vulnerable, but that's more of a necessity than it is a tactical decision. The second one is a grappling line, which might have been cool, only this thing can only go on a downward trajectory, not up. Would have really given you some fun options with mobility during combat, you know, being able to get high above enemies and use that verticality to your advantage. Instead, yeah, it only goes down. And the only times I ever really used it was when I had to. The third mode is the ability to hack into terminals. Again, something which you only ever need to do at mostly fixed points. Enemies will set off alarms and call in reinforcements, so you're gonna need to hack the panels to stop more guys from pouring in, but yeah, that's about it. It's never used in like a clever tactical sense or anything creative like that. Like imagine being able to hack into someone's helmet and jam their vision or send them false orders to make them leave the area. I don't know, just something creative. Anything. Then finally, it's got a shield mode where it hovers in the air and puts out a protective barrier in front of the player, preventing you from taking damage, kind of. And out of all the modes, I found this one to be the most fun because at least I can actually use it in any scenario. This is all of course controlled by using the touchpad on the PlayStation 4 controller because, you know, the 6-axis controls weren't bad enough to begin with on the PlayStation 3, so this time they had to find another awful gimmick to implement. I think it might have actually been done out of necessity because every single other button on that controller already has a function to it to the point that it's almost confusing. But there's a reason why barely no other games aside from this, and I think Infamous Second Son used this feature. You know, what's basically just a giant ugly pause button, because it's a gimmick, and it sucks. They really break the mold about halfway through the game when you team up with Echo, and for this entire level you can tag enemies, and then she'll take them out from a distance with her sniper rifle. Somehow, always managing to get a shot off and have a perfect vantage point. Target killed. And it's the most unexciting, impactless effect too when someone gets hit by her. They just kind of slump to the ground like a sack of potatoes. Neutralized. Later on, they break even more ground as you've then got to return the favor and cover her with her own rifle. Yeah, the irony. Good shooting. At some point throughout this level, you'll need to hack these spider bots to destroy cameras or terminals. And they're so lazy with this that most of the time, these things are just laying dormant right next to the spot you need to use them. It's like they couldn't even be bothered going off and putting them somewhere hard for the player to find. You know, heaven forbid the level design encourages some actual exploration. You'll also have to deal with these things on the flip side, hacking their containers to stop them from endlessly spawning in, and they're further proof that small, exploding enemies are the absolute bane of FPS level design. You know, along with turrets and mines. Oh shit! 
that. One of the last levels has you planting petricide containers into these machines to destroy these giant sentry towers. And I just want to say that fighting giant robots is never fun in any game ever made. And that's a hill I'll die on. And it's just the same tedious procedure repeated those three or four times until the whole level comes to an end. It doesn't get challenging or exciting, it just kind of feels like a chore. Repeating the same task like you're washing dishes or hanging clothes out on the line. Those free falling sections or the one where you're moving about in low gravity might be some of the worst things ever created. The free falling sequence is just needlessly difficult because that console FOV makes it impossible to see your surroundings. And you get no real tutorial or introduction to the low gravity levels, and then you just kind of expect it to come to grips with the controls as you're under attack with these constant incoming threats. I don't even know what's going on half the time here, so I just keep shooting at stuff until the whole thing ends. I mean, that seemed to work. There are a couple of good ideas in there though. I think one of the best sequences in the game is the one on a space station when you're trying to escape. And while you're being shot at, you can shoot away these protective blinds from the windows that lets in the harsh Helgen sun. This of course fries anything that happens to be caught in it, which is just a cool effect. One section later in the game has you controlling drones, and you can send these things after the foot soldiers or make them focus fire on the tougher units. And again, it's pretty damn fun. Just because it breaks up the tedium of pressing the combination of L2 and R2 until everything's dead. Plus I like this bit here too when you've got to run across no man's land, if only because it kind of felt challenging and took my weapons away from me, causing my asshole to pucker up so tight that I could probably use it to crush rocks and turn them into gravel. Fire. Fire. There's another cool level early on in the game where the Hellgast attacked the VSA disguised as soldiers, and this might have been a really clever mission, making it hard to tell who was an enemy and who was an ally, it's just they don't even bother exploring that concept. Because despite the Hellgast having these very effective disguises, for some reason they all turn them off, you know, making it easier to spot them. Okay. It all just kind of makes me miss some of those vehicle sequences from Killzone 3, which is something I never thought I'd say. I mean, at least then they tried to mix things up a bit. Here it's like they didn't even bother getting past the basic concepts. And it's things like this where you start to understand just how rushed and unfinished the whole thing feels. Almost like they've just kind of given up where I really knew they'd given up was during the final room, which, much like Killzone 2, is just rooms and rooms full of constantly spawning enemies who come out of these doors which only seem to exist to spawn them in. And in fact, the only way I managed to beat this area was by exploiting that and rushing through one of those doorways when it opened because it was the only spot in the room where I had cover and wouldn't get constantly ambushed from behind. And comparing this to Killzone 2 I think is a perfect example, because despite how good the whole thing looks and all the upgrades they made to the presentation, it still feels like you're playing something from an older console. You know, new gen graphics, old gen gameplay. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. For some reason you stuck around for the entire campaign and managed to make it to the end, well, then you'll be witness to the ultimate dumb video game logic shit, as our hero Kellen, who up until this point has survived about a bazillion bullet wounds, is suddenly killed in a cinematic by a single bullet. Come again. And that marks the end of the game. You finished Killzone Shadowfall. Thanks for watching. No, I'm kidding, son. This is actually a fake ending, cut into credits for a bit before then revealing it's a psych out. As you instead then get to play through an entire epilogue sequence as Echo. But the thing that actually surprised me is that this whole section is actually pretty damn good. You've got a cloak which makes you invisible and lets you avoid getting seen, not to mention a silenced pistol. Finally. And it's actually really fun sneaking around and taking enemies out. You've got to watch their patrol routes, you've got to time your takedowns right, and actually use skill to make it through unseen. And all I can think this entire time was, why didn't they use this for the rest of the game? Yeah, let's keep all the solid stealth mechanics for a 10 minute epilogue at the end of the whole game. Yeah, good one, Gorilla. This all ends when Echo manages to get a good shot on Sinclair, assassinating him for killing Kellen, and preventing him from using the aftermath of the previous events to incite a war against the Hellgast. And in a final display of someone at Gorilla clearly not giving a fuck, you get this awful sight of this spinning bullet heading for Sinclair's head before the game finally ends. <laughs>
I kind of look at this last sequence as a bit of a metaphor for Guerrilla killing off the Killzone brand because after this game, they focused entirely on the Horizon series. In fact, I think they're now even working on a third game for that franchise as we speak, which, if the second game is any indicator, is going to have Alloy given an almost constant commentary on the entire campaign from start to finish like she's a sports commentator. Never! Personally, I hope Guerrilla just leave Killzone alone and I don't see any reason for them to go back and make another one, especially now considering that two out of these four main games are mid as fuck to begin with. I mean, it's not like they're going to be reviving this masterpiece of a franchise. The PlayStation 4 would eventually end up having some pretty dope exclusives. You know, you had things like God of War, Ghost of Tsushima, Spider-Man and Bloodborne. And look, maybe if Shadowfall had a bit more time in the oven, it could have joined those ranks. But it ended up being a sad swan song on a console that should have done it better for a series that deserved more. No! But at least now this video is done, people can stop asking me about it and I'll never have to play it again.